we turn now to the specific nature of the danger facing people should that Japanese reactor in fact melt down. Joining me, ABC News consultant, physics professor Michio Kaku. Professor, we've seen the helicopters dropping water on the site. If that doesn't work, what's next? That helicopter dropping borated water is like a squirt gun trying to put out a forest fire. Too little, too late. I think we're extremely close now to the point of no return. Just a few more slight glitches and we're going to be in an uncontrolled breach of containment. That is a class 7 accident. That is a full-scale Chernobyl. You think meltdown is inevitable at this point? Almost inevitable. At a certain point, the workers going into that site will be on a suicide mission. They will have to abandon ship. And without anyone taking care of the reactor cores, we will have three simultaneous breach of containments. Already, Units 2 and Units 3 have cracks in their containment vessels. Already, Unit 4 has a raging fire, we think, involving spent fuel that is not contained by any containment vessel. So we are very close now to something that is even bigger than Chernobyl. So, Professor, what's the worst case scenario look like in that area 12 miles around the reactor if, in fact, there is a meltdown? I mean, are people going to die within that region? What about the, the radiation plume? In a worst case scenario, you have breach of containment. The containment structure springs a leak, you have an explosion, the thing cracks apart and, re and releases large quantities of radiation into the atmosphere. That area will become a dead zone. It will be impossible to grow anything. People in that area will die. We're talking about lives at stake. And that's why I would say, if I had the ear of the Prime Minister, forget about using squirt guns. Call in the Japanese Air Force. Hit that reactor with concrete, sand, and boric acid. Seal it in a car car sarcophagus. Entomb it just like the Soviets entombed the Chernobyl accident in 1986. I think we're very close to that option now. We're going to have to leave it there. Professor Kaku, our thanks, and thank you for watching ABC News. We hope. Thirty-five years ago, Dale Breidenbaugh resigned from his job at General Electric. It was in protest for what he saw as critical design flaws in the Mark I nuclear reactor design. That's the same design used at Fukushima Daiichi Power Plant in Japan. Dale Breidenbaugh joins us now from San Jose, California. Dale, welcome and thanks for joining us. Well, thank you. So first, what was it about that design that bothered you that led you to, uh, to resign? Well, it bothered me and it bothered a lot of other people. In 1975, it became aware that the design of the Mark I containments uh, had not taken into account all of the uh, loads that they could experience during a design basis accident, a loss of coolant accident. So it was necessary to mount a crash program to reanalyze uh, those, uh, those loads and uh, to see what uh, n modifications needed to be made and whether the plants were continued safe to run. I was, uh, at the time, there were 16 Mark I plants in operation in the United States and another uh, eight under construction. I was asked to be the project manager of that reassessment. Okay, now, now put this into English for us. Uh, we're not all nuclear <laughs> design engineers the way you are. And so what was it that you really were worried about? What was the sort of event that was going to create a crisis that you were worried about and have those events happened and, and tell us, carry this through over the years? Has GE addressed this issue adequately from your perspective? Okay, well, the event uh, that was under consideration uh, would be a large loss of coolant accident. What that means is a break of one of the large pipes in the reactor primary system and the release, uh, subsequent release of uh, steam and uh, fission products and uh, into the containment structure itself. Uh, it was, uh, it had not been uh, considered that this event would cause dynamic loads, let's say heavy, vibra heavy vibrations in the reactor suppression pool that could uh, cause the containment system to fail. 
Okay, well, I'm going to no. keep bringing you back, though, to plain English. <laughs> what you're worried about is this thing was going to lose its coolant. It's kind of like if your car engine loses, loses its, its coolant, you know that engine block is just going to seize up and you're out of luck. So you're worried you that the, the, the reactors are just going to overheat. And when a nuclear reactor overhe overheats, bad, bad, bad things happen. It, it, am I getting this right? You, you're absolutely right. Now, it was perhaps even worse than that. The uh, steam that would be released from a large break was supposed to be uh, condensed and uh, by the water in the suppression pool in the uh, in the large torus structure, and uh, the concern was that if the structure failed as a result of these unconsidered uh, loads, you would lose containment, uh, which they may have done at uh, one of the Fukushima plants now. And you would also lose the source of cooling water for the reactor core. So the, the, the thing that was of potential trouble is you could have a core meltdown it, and uncontrolled release of radioactive material. I mean, it sounds to me kind of like what you're describing is what's happening there in terms of the loss of coolant and the overheating that results. Am, am I being oversimplistic or, or it was, is your fear kind of what's been happening here? Well, it's kind of what's been happening, but the the cause of the overheating uh, is different at Fukushima than the one that we were considering at GE. Uh, at Fukushima, the cause of the uh, accident that are fighting right now is uh, the combined earthquake and the tsunami, which wiped out all of the emerge uh, all of the backup power systems on site and so they have not been able to cool the reactor core the way the system was designed let me ask uh, ask you one other question which which may, may be something or may not be something you looked at we're seeing this potential fire the fire which potentially is in the spent fuel rod pool which is in, in essentially a less protected part of the reactor why was it designed that, that you didn't give these spent fuel rods as much protection as the reactor and that they could sort of release stuff into the, into the atmosphere if something went wrong? That, that seems like an odd design uh, decision to me. Well, on all five of the Mark I plants at Fukushima, the spent fuel pool is in the same, uh, same place with respect to the reactor. It's up on the reactor refueling floor. It's there because it, uh, it makes it very handy when they go into refueling. They don't have to move the fuel very far to get it out of the reactor or get it into the reactor. And, uh, of course, ultimately, it is uh, after it cools off in that pool for a while, it is moved out of the reactor building and into a, another storage pool, which is uh, common to the vi uh, five or six units at the plant. Uh, it, uh, it, the, the spent fuel pool itself is actually in the reactor building, and uh, under normal circumstances, uh, they, it has cooling, and there should not be any problem with it. But of course, you know, dealing with contingencies, if you lose that cooling and you still have these spent rods that have a fair bit of radioactivity and heat with them, that's when you can get the sort of, uh, of reaction that you're worried about. So I, I guess I'm wondering, I'm, I'm, a, you know, I'm not an engineer, obviously, but why you wouldn't put some greater protection over that pool to protect it from the outside environment and vice versa, protect the outside env environment from the, that, that pool. Uh, the structure is supposed to be designed to withstand the maximum credible earthquake. Uh, uh, the spent fuel is cooled by the water that's in this uh, large pool. It's like a big swimming pool. Uh, you would, uh, under, again, under normal circumstances, you would have a number of hours or days before you'd have to take any action. Uh, it's not clear to me why this fire has occurred on unit number four, uh, it, it should not have. Unit four wasn't even in operation when the, uh, when the earthquake hit, but it was under maintenance, uh, under a maintenance program, and so uh, it's my understanding that all of the fuel had been offloaded from the reactor into the spent fuel pool. So it's uh, basically holding pretty hot fuel that would not normally be the case. All right, Dale Breidenbaugh, thank you for joining us tonight, and thank you for all your hard work over the years. All right, we will be right back.